And now we're back. We're rejoining journalist and Mahalnik, Tom Tungan. When you got to off the ship, you got into the circulation. Uh, what did you do? Well, it was a little bit like uh, you know during medieval times the. Lord of the Manor used to sort of recruit his own people. He went to the peasants, said, "If you come, you know, fight with me, uh, I'll let you keep a part of your harvest, or, or you get uh, a couple of pounds." And you sort of freelanced it. And when he mentioned uh, one day, a uh, guy came. He had been a major in the American Army, Les Gorn, and he said, "We are forming an, an anti-tank unit." And uh, uh, would you like to join? I said, "What's you know, what's your offer?" And he said, we're going to have a democratic unit. There's not going to be no rank, no saluting. And except in combat, all decisions will be taken by, by majority vote. And as an ex-private first class and sergeant, that really <laughs> appealed to me. <laughs> I said, OK, uh, you got a deal. You got your authority and some more strikes. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> and when we got, to, uh, got there, there was a uh, wooden dummy gun. And I said, where's the anti-tank? guns to be a tank unit. And the guy said, well, we, we don't have any yet, but as soon as the infantry captures some guns from the Arabs, then we'll be, uh, uh, we'll be in business. And uh, we finally got a, a, what they called a 17-pounder from World War I British Army, which had been given to, from Glub Pasha to the Jordanian Army. And uh, later on, uh, we went with this you know, archaic thing uh, in the somewhat later, we were at the Fallujah pocket, uh, where we had trapped a group of uh, a a Egyptians commanded by, by a Colonel Nasser, and they said one day they said, "Look, we got a shipment of real anti-tank guns now. They're still in oil cloth. They just came from Czechoslovakia, so we unwrapped in their 50 millimeter anti-tank gun, and on the side of it was a big swastika." So you had this wonderful irony of a bunch of Jewish kids shooting at Arabs with a gun made for the Nazi army and with a swastika. You know, in the Air Force, and now you're saying in, 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 in the ground forces, there seem to be a lot of arms coming from Czechoslovakia. Yeah. Why from the Czechs? Because they were the only ones. Uh, a, a, they had, the, the Skoda Works had done a lot of the German army, including the Messerschmitts with the Air Force, and the anti-tank guns. When it was the war ended, they had all this one, and they were one of the very few who were w willing to sell. You know, America had an arms embargo, Britain had an arms embargo, and the Czechs said for, for a few good, bucks. good money, yeah. for very good money, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do it. And so, so it was a premium cost to uh, oh, Israel. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was everything, but they were happy you know, in any place at that time to, to uh, as I, my illustration of this, wooden anti-tank gun. Uh, you know, by those of us used to the American army or any modern army, uh, this, this was like, you know, going to dog patch. And <laughs> I, I'd like to make uh, one point clear because it's, it's, it's uh, somewhat difficult. Uh, there is a tendency to talk about the Air Force uh, because A, it's more glamorous and, and uh, it was also somewhat more dramatic. Uh, and I think the Americans, the British, Canadian contributed. But the war itself was won on the ground, as World War II was won on the ground, despite what the Air Force claims. And that the Israelis won. Uh, it, it's on the one hand, we are you know, somewhat miffed that they don't mention our contribution. But on the other hand, don't go overboard and say, hey, you know, if it hadn't been for you guys, uh, it wouldn't, there wouldn't be in Israel. The Israelis took the casualties. The Israelis took the ground and the Israelis uh, did the work. Uh, that's one point. The, the other point is... But, but I'm not sure I'm missing one thing because, okay. in a sense, you are an Israeli. No. You're a Machelnik from overseas, but you're fighting for Israel with the Israelis. I mean, you become a quasi-Israeli, as far as I uh, can see. First of all, you had some. Well, for, for one thing, it depended. I was, unfortunately, in what they called an Anglo-Saxon unit. We, Jews who had been Jews in America, in Canada suddenly became Anglo-Saxons once we came to the United so States. you were never accepted as regular Israelis, no, even though you were no, fighting for Israel? No, no. Uh, we were Anglo-Saxons. We, we had Canadians. We had South Africans, which were incidentally the best of the lot. 
Uh, we had even two Australians. Uh, uh, they were all English speaking, and that the reason was because just before they had taken a bunch of refugees off the ship in Latrun and put them, and here's a picture of them, and put them uh, in the front lines, and they couldn't understand the Hebrew commands, and they were, there was right. slaughter. You might have heard about it. Let, let's, let, let me so see this, this picture one, here, and then we'll put is, it on the I screen. Believe was in, uh, this is the truth. This was is one of the infantry companies uh -huh. charging okay. up the hill. Okay. And what else do you have here? Uh, this is a. Uh, I think that's you, right? Piece I wrote, yeah, yeah, when I had a lot, lot more hair. And wow. This is a great lot, picture. Lot wrinkles. This is great. <laughs> we'll, we'll put this on the screen. And that's me now. on this. Uh, Done with a Nazi. It doesn't show the swastika, but that's the one that Here. we got from courtesy of the German army. And that Amazing is. piece of history. And the interesting thing, it's not so interesting, it's kind of a sad commentary, is most Jews in America don't know the story. Actually, when you take all the Anglo Saxon countries, English speaking countries, the United States played the least glorious role in the American Jewish community. In South Africa and England, they actually had their own, like a selective service. You had uh, wow. uh, service and, and so on, and they sent money over, and they were celebrated. Uh, at that time, the American Jewish community uh, was very uh, worried about, well, what are they going to say about double loyalty? And maybe those crazy kids are going to say, well, yeah, but you can't, uh, you know, what about the Jews? Very timid. It ties in with the whole thing, why we didn't do more about the Holocaust at the time. And they really kept it quiet. They didn't, they didn't really want to draw any attention to it. And whether that sort of carried over afterwards, uh, but uh, I think that may be one of the, the, the reasons that the, really the American Jewish community uh, did not play a very glorious part, I think, during that year. We won, you mentioned earlier Schwimmer and Hank. And yeah. I mean, these were people that didn't go to fight, but they, they made yeah. Yeah. A, a great personal commitment right. Right. to bring right. arms to Israel, yeah. right? Yeah, no, no, there, there's, there's no question. I'm not downplaying uh, what, what they did, I think, was, was crucial. And they, you know, risked jail and, and, and so on. So all, all I time. think Schwimmer, Al Schwimmer missed jail, but he did he did become a felon. Right. And right. if I recall, uh, he couldn't vote. And Hank's son, Brian, got him uh, a reprieve or, uh, from Clinton. Right. And then afterwards he said, but I didn't want that. I don't need to vote. That's right. I'm honored to be <laughs> on behalf of Israel. That's so right. I shipped arms. It's okay with me. Right. I don't want to vote. Yeah, yeah, right. And, and, and he said he, he, he would have, if he admitted his uh, you know, guilt and apologized, said, I'm not going to apologize. I'm not guilty. Yeah. <laughs> great story. No, he was great, and so was Hank Greenberg, who might be probably new. Greenspun. Greenspun, sorry. Yeah. Greenspun. Yeah. Hank Greenspun and Al Schwimmer. The story obviously changed your life. I mean, you are a different Tom than if you hadn't gone to Israel. I don't know if you remember Kilroy, the World War II figure, and whenever American GIs came, somebody had scrawled on the wall, Kilroy was here. And I feel whatever we did or did not contribute to the War of Independence, we were there uh, during, you know, something that happens every 2,000 years or so, the establishment of a Jewish state. And I think uh, in that we can take some pride. God willing, it'll be another 2,000 years. You're maybe more. Here. Maybe more. Thank you. you. You've been a great Thank legend you. for me Thank as you. a journalist for JTA and the Los Angeles Jewish Journal. Uh, we'll be right back. The South Africans had been cultured and conditioned in their own way. They were not native to the land in which they were fighting. Everything from military discipline to language to cultural habits was foreign to them. Their integration with the native Israelis was not seamless. That wasn't easy. Because we couldn't speak their language. No, but they said, you've got to go and learn Hebrew. And I said, no, no, I didn't come to Israel to learn Hebrew. I came here to do a job. The Michalniks integrated themselves into every division of the army. And their contribution was invaluable. But perhaps the most profound of the South African volunteers' contributions was in the skies. Without South African volunteers, there would have been no Air Force. 